Welcome to worship here at First Pres, and we are so happy to see all of you and those who are worshiping with us from home. A very, very happy Mother's Day and Women's Day to all of our women today and to all of us who have mothers. Praise be to God. And you may have noted when you came in, we're going to talk about this more a little bit later, but there was a special handmade gift from Darlene for every woman. So I hope you got one now, and if you didn't, they are there for after worship for you to get one as well. A huge thanks to Darlene for crafting those for us. I wanted to lift up several announcements as we begin our worship today. Um, first, you note that the colors that have been added for this Sunday to our communion table include the gold and the kind of burnt orange color. Today's woman that we are speaking about is traditionally known as the widow's mite. And might, M-I-T-E, is actually um, a currency of coins. Um, and they would have looked kind of copper in color. And so that is why I chose those colors today to represent her um, and her love through those coins. You noticed in your e-call that we advertised for a really special mental health training that is happening this upcoming Saturday. It is in Indianapolis, so I know that that is quite a drive, but if any of you are interested in going, um, thinking about your grandchildren, um, children you work with, this first one in the series particularly focuses on youth, ages 12 to 24. It's something I had the opportunity to help in the presbytery to plan. We have phenomenal therapists coming to speak um, and talk about the huge level of anxiety and depression and even suicide that is happening um, in young people currently in our country. So I think it will be a really meaningful training. Um, for those who are interested in doing something geared towards older adult health and mental health, that will be coming later in the year. So I'll be sure to keep you up to date when that training happens. Next Sunday, we are celebrating Pentecost, so I am eager to celebrate that day with you. I invite you on that day to wear red, as we often do, or purple, or both, because the woman we're speaking about next week is Lydia, who was a dealer of purple fabric. So feel free to wear red or purple next Sunday. I hope that's all I see in the congregation next week. Um, after worship, Darlene is throwing us a party for the end of the year. So a huge thanks to Darlene for that. Also, the offering we will collect next week on Pentecost is going towards the purchase um, of a beautiful Bible for Miley um, and also for the North Park Project here in town. The other 50% is going towards um, the special mental health program through the Presbytery that I just spoke about. I believe that is everything. Oh, Cafe Conversations. I see Garrett coming in. This is our last Sunday of the season for Cafe Conversations. So if you're able, we hope you'll join us um, for the very last one, speaking about rest, um, restoring our souls as we enter into this summer season. Are there other announcements to lift up today? Then let us center our minds and hearts as Carolyn offers us our prelude. <laughs>
Please rise as you are able for our call to worship. Holy One, we gather in your presence to celebrate the gift of your love, a love that supports, nurtures, and challenges us in ways that transform us. Today, as we celebrate Mother's Day, we give thanks for our mothers. As we gather this day, compassionate God, we pray for those who grieve for any reason, knowing that this is an emotional day for many of us. Let us join together in singing the hymn, Praise to God, the World's Creator. Invite us to join together in our prayer for wholeness and assurance of God's grace, praying responsibly. God, many of us don't think we have much to offer. Or in our desire to gain approval and our love for nurturing. But we know that you see us and desire abundant life for us. Our two-bit gifts, our weariness, because you are abundantly loving, abundantly patient, abundantly bold, abundantly generous. Help us believe it. Inspire us to live it. Amen. I invite us to rise as we sing Glory to God.
peace of Christ be with you. Let us share the peace of Christ with everyone here and with those worshiping from home. be seated. <clears throat> Loving God, may we feel your grace, your love, your compassion on this special day. May we all know how worthy we are to experience your love and to share that love with others. Open our minds, open our hearts, open our ears to hear you in expanded ways on this day. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. Let us listen for the word of God. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins called mites, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had. All she had to live on. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Last week, I began our sermon series by asking how many of you have heard the story of Rizpah preached before? No one raised their hands. So this week, I ask how many of you have heard the story of the widow's might preached before? Most all of us. Indeed, this week there were many, many more resources available for studying this passage. And what I find fascinating is that almost all of them came to the same conclusion. A conclusion that I too have preached in the past. That this woman is the example of sacrificial giving, we are all called to model. 
Thus, this widow's story is often used during stewardship campaigns to promote giving. The message is you never have too little to give. Look, the widow gave 100% of what she had. We are all called to do the same. It doesn't seem wise, does it? To give so much that one has nothing left to live on. But this must be what Jesus intended, because why else would he point out the, women, the woman's actions to his followers? Yet this year, perhaps because this story falls on Mother's Day, I found myself questioning the merit of encouraging people to give so sacrificially. I, being a woman, and counseling with many women over the years know that sacrifice is a huge unspoken expectation in many of our lives. Being a woman who can balance all things, work and home and meal prep and caring for children or aging parents, volunteering, all with a gentle, <coughs> calm, nurturing demeanor is valued. Many of us feel guilty when we cannot do it. Momentarily taking a break from nurturing others to do something crazy like take a bubble bath or even a 10 minute nap, five would be fine, is not traditionally celebrated. <laughs> Sometimes such opportunities occur on special days like birthdays or Mother's Day. But for many of us, self-care is not a regular practice. Women and men learn from a young age that sacrifice is praised. The truth is neither the church nor any other volunteer organization for that matter would exist if there were not people who were willing to share their gifts, both of time and of money. The challenge for me then is not to stop giving, but to find a way to give out of our abundance and not from a place of depletion or guilt. Many of us find a great deal of meaning in giving of ourselves. It's when we give so much that we have nothing left. Or when we give and give without ever being acknowledged for our efforts, that giving becomes burdensome. A sacrifice and not a life-giving choice. This made me question, is there a different way to interpret the widow's might story. So this week, while I did read many pastors and theologians' interpretations, I also expanded my research to include archaeological journals and writings from first century historian Josephus. What I have pieced together has given me a new perspective to ponder. Could it be that this new interpretation is what Jesus intended for us all along. I invite you to take a look at the cover of your bulletin. You can see the vast difference between Solomon's temple and King Herod's temple. Solomon was King David's son. He built the first temple soon after the scripture lesson that we studied last week. Nearly 1,000 years later, King Herod, who reigned during Jesus' life, had a much larger temple built. As you can see, Herod greatly enlarged the original temple. It is many times larger than even an American football field. The project took nearly, get this, 80 years.
to complete. 80 years. Josephus, an eyewitness of the temple, wrote, the exterior of the building lacked nothing that could astound the mind or the eye. To approaching strangers, it appeared from a distance like a snow-clad mountain. For all that was not laid with gold was of purest white. Historical documents record that it took nearly 10,000 builders to complete. You can see that in the first temple, there is one big courtyard all on the same level surrounding the holy place where the sacrifices took place. Thus, there was no separation of men or women in Solomon's temple. Instead, males and females, Jews and Gentiles alike, worshiped together. King Herod, on the other hand, was very intentional about designing the temple to separate categories of people, creating separate courtyards for various classes of people. Josephus writes in another document, into the first court, everybody was allowed to go, even foreigners, and none but women during their courses were prohibited to pass through it. All the Jews went into the second court, as well as their wives, when they were free from all uncleanness. Into the third court, the court of the Israelites, went in the Jewish men, when they were clean and purified. Archaeological journals depict that the courtyard for men was elevated 15 steps from that of the women's courtyard which made it nearly impossible for the women to see the sacrifices taking place. All Jewish men and women were required to take a pilgrimage to this temple for at least three festivals throughout the year. Those who lived closer to the temple went frequently for worship, similar to what we experience today, which included scripture reading and teaching and hymn singing. The primary focus of the temple at this time, however, was to perform sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. Priests would perform these sacrifices on a daily basis, every single day of the year. All practicing Jews were required to give money for the five major sacrifices that were under the law of Moses. Priests would inform the worshiper of what sin they needed to atone for and then disclose the requirements for receiving forgiveness. A specific sacrifice was associated with each sin. Ironically, while women were not allowed to witness the sacrifices, the treasury that paid for these sacrifices surrounded the courtyard, the women's courtyard. The treasury consisted of 13 chests, known as trumpets, where the money was given. The chests were called trumpets because they looked like a trumpet, having a horn shape that people would put the money into and it would drop into the chest below. The trumpet shape emphasized the sound of the money being dropped into that particular chest as various coins, as we all know, make different sounds based on their weight. This was another way of separating people based on economic means. These trumpets would have been found behind the columns that were in the women's courtyard. You can visualize it as you look at the front of your bulletin. Each of the 13 trumpets had a specific designation. One was for the purchase of incense, one for wood, one for wine, several for various sacrifices um, through animals. Each was ear tagged with a specific cost. In order to be made right in the community, every Jewish man and woman was expected to make his contributions to the proper trumpet for the required cost in order to have their sins forgiven. 
If the giver gave more than the stipulated cost of an offering, the leftover amount was accumulated and went toward future sin and guilt offerings. Interesting, right? <laughs> Two chests were reserved for temple tax, one for the current year and one for the previous year. Upkeep of that temple was very expensive. This treasury system made this extraordinary temple, a renowned wonder of antiquity, possible. These practices may be making you think about pre-Reformation years. The Reformation occurred about 1,500 years later. Jesus, as a Jewish male, was required to go to the temple. Yet it appears through several scripture passages and historical writings that he often intentionally chose to position himself in the women's courtyard, the place where both men and women could gather together. He could have easily joined just the men in the elevated courtyard, yet repeatedly he chose to remain in the women's courtyard to teach and observe. In our passage today, he observes the woman giving two mites. Two mites is more than two pennies, as many translations suggest. It would actually have been closer to the equivalent of a little over a half day's wage for an average worker. Jesus says, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had. Everything she had to live on. Jesus doesn't use acclamations to praise her for her actions as I had previously imagined. Jesus is simply stating a fact. If Jesus was encouraging his followers to live like this woman, surely he could have chosen anyone who gave generously on that day. Instead, he specifically chose a widow. Why? Often we read this passage removed from its context, but the scenario actually takes place in the middle of a teaching moment from Jesus. Jesus has just said this, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers they will receive the greater condemnation. You see, in order for the expansion of this temple to take place, a lot of land where many people resided was taken through eminent domain. We often think of widows as poor and destitute, and many at the time would have been. But the reality was there were also many who actually owned their own property. Yet when King Herod took their homes for this massive construction project, they were left destitute. For without equity and a home, it was nearly impossible for them to begin again, especially if they had children to raise. Making money was not nearly as easy for women as men at the time. Additionally, while authorities promised to redistribute the temple collections to the needy, in actuality, they spent much of it for the upkeep of the temple, to purchase glamorous robes, and to host extravagant banquets. This is why Jesus says, Beware of the scribes in long robes, for they devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. Today's passage is indeed about generosity. 
but a different kind of generosity than we often recognize. Jesus is calling his followers to expand their definition of what generosity means. For Jesus, generosity is about valuing all of God's creation. Value doesn't just come in the form of money. It resides within each one of us simply because every single one of us is made in God's image. To be generous is to recognize the value in each other and thus to support one another so that when we do give, we are able to do so out of abundance and not out of obligation or guilt or depletion. That is huge. While Presbyterians speak about grace a lot, in the back of many of our minds, we still feel like we have to earn approval or love. Because in most of life, we do. Jesus sees the value in each of us and hopes that we can see the value in each other, too. So we will support one another in a way that does not allow one person or one group of people to carry the load for everyone else. Instead, we will all be partners, men and women, young and old, friend and stranger, giving what we can because we want to. And because we trust that other people will do the same. There are so many ways to interpret scripture. None of us living today experienced King Herod's temple or the scene with the widow. Yet I find it helpful to allow myself to go out of my comfort zone to interpret passages I've heard many times in various ways. For each time I do, I gain a new insight and needed perspective I didn't have before. On this Mother's Day, I give thanks for a new interpretation on this passage. For I believe that Jesus offers us a profound lesson about generosity. Women, being generous doesn't always mean we sacrifice until we drop. <laughs> Quite the opposite, actually. Jesus wants all of us women and men, to know that no one should have to run on empty. Indeed, that is why God created all of us with value, so we can rely on one another. Being generous is crucial. I love giving, giving of myself to others. But giving is only sustainable when it is done from a life-giving choice and not from an obligation or from guilt or from depletion. Jesus taught us such an important lesson that day. Every one of us has value. May we support one another by choosing to live in such a generous way as Jesus taught so long ago. Amen. In response, I invite you to share with me and proclaiming what it is we believe through our affirmation of faith, which was written by Fran Pratt, a PCUSA pastor. Let us share together. We believe that when we offer up ourselves, 
our time, our resources, our attention, you make miracles with what we've offered. Water becomes wine. Loaves and fish become food for thousands. Streams flow in deserts. No gift is too small in your eyes. No start is too humble. No moment too late. No effort unseen. The smallest seed becomes the largest tree. The most ordinary generosity changes the world. We also believe that sometimes the greatest gift of all is to give nothing tangible. Instead, to simply recognize our inherent worth simply because you created us. To recognize the worth in others because you created them too. Sometimes the best gift is to know that this is enough. Therefore, we strive to live as Jesus taught time and again, by doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God. One of the ways we live out this mission is by lifting up our gifts to God so that God's work can continue to be done in this place, in this community, and in all of those we are connected to. So I invite you to give your gifts this day and to rise with me as we sing our praise to God. Loving God, thank you for all of the ways you speak into our lives. May these gifts truly spread your generosity in all of the ways that means through this special place. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. I invite us on this day to lift up our joys and concerns for this family or for our community. I want to extend a huge welcome to both of you for being here in worship. It is a tremendous joy. Hopefully you will get the appropriate amount of flooding from people after worship to welcome you for being here today. Um, it is good to see all of you. I also wanted to lift up that at the last women's gathering this past Wednesday, the idea came about to support um, both a women's mission um, called the Hope Center outside of Indy and make that into a trip where we would also go see Jean Stutz because I know we are all missing her tremendously. She has moved into a new home where she's able to get more care in Indianapolis. Um, Rob has her contact information and we will be sure to have that in the e-call for everyone this week. Um, Please, please send cards to her. But on June 14th, the second Wednesday of next month, um, we have gotten the go-ahead to have a trip to do this mission and also to go have lunch and a gathering with Jean. So if you are interested, please let us know. We would love to have everyone there um, for that special day. We also want to lift up prayers for Diana, who was our office administrative assistant for many, many years here. Um, she is going through a lot of pain with rheumatoid arthritis, trying to figure out um, how to regain um, her life again from just being overwhelmed with so much pain. So many, many, many prayers for her. Are there others to lift up today? Yes, Judy. Oh, my goodness, wonderful. So for a very, very safe delivery for Dee and for this beautiful new child about to enter the world, many, many prayers. A boy, oh my goodness. Wonder Do you know the name yet? Is it a secret? 
Of course. <laughs> good, good idea, Greg. <laughs> Well, we will await the news next week to see what the name is. That's wonderful. Are there others to lift up today? Yes, Jeff. Yes, a friend of ours named Deborah has come to a great deal of uh, uh, just a, having a hard time in his life with drug counting. He felt very good. Absolutely okay, Devin. Any others? Yes, Polly. Uh, Absolutely, thank you. Yes, many, many, many prayers always for Cheryl. Rock's wife. Okay, let us go to God in the spirit of prayer then. Loving God, thank you for giving us such inquisitive minds that are able to expand and consider multiple perspectives at various times. You know our stories. Some of us are in a season of life when we feel overwhelmed, trying to do it all, maxed out. Others of us have lots of time. We are determining what our identity looks like when life isn't so full of expectations and activities. Through every season of life, you see immense value in us. Help us see our value and recognize the value in others, too. Inspire us to give of ourselves when we are able, and to courageously rely on others when we need to. You made all of creation to be partners, so we don't feel like the burden is left solely to a few. God, on this day, remind us of Rizpah's blessing from last week, that one small deed done is better than far greater deeds imagined, but left undone. One step at a time, God. Together, our understanding of generosity and living your love can be bigger and more life-giving than we ever imagined. On this day, God, we lift up prayers prayers of relief from pain and healing for Diana, prayers that Jean feels the comfort and love of her friends and family in this very new time of transition, prayers for Devin. You know exactly what he needs in this very moment. Pour your presence upon him. We pray for Cheryl and Rock, and this uncertain time, this time that must put them on such edge, may they have hope for each day. May they have moments of peace and know how loved they are. We pray for Miley and the gift she is so willing to offer her care and her nurture to children in this congregation just the joy of our kids, Caleb and Magdalena, lighting up when they saw her today. We pray for Christian's family, for D, that this birth can go smoothly and quickly and have minimal pain, and that this beautiful boy comes into this wonderful world where he knows such compassion and love. God, we pray for all the women who have nurtured us and cared for us, who we have laughed with and learned from. Today, may we give thanks for them in as many ways as we can dream up. All of this we pray as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. May we join together in singing as upbeat as we can. I sing because I'm happy. Why should I feel discouraged? Let us rise and sing together.
Amen. I hope if you're able, you stay for a cafe conversation, share something to eat and a hot drink and, and good conversation as we close this wonderful year. Um, I've been so grateful to see so many people who have stayed for that conversation class. It does the spirit so well. So I just thank you all for that, even if you aren't able to stay today. I also wanted to mention again that I hope everyone got this beautiful handmade gift from Darlene today. If you didn't, be sure to see her after the worship service. It comes with a note that says, this is a blessing bracelet inspired by a Hallmark movie. She's speaking to my heart. Find each big bead, four total, and name a blessing on each one. Do this every day to remind you of what God has done. Embrace and celebrate the amazing woman that you are, just the way God made you. Amen to that, right? I will join you in this practice of breaking up all those critical negative thoughts I can get in my head to look for the positive. Thank you, Darlene. And I invite us all at this time to share together in the charge and benediction. May God, who gave birth to all creation, bless us. May God, who became incarnate by an earthly mother, bless us. May God, who broods as a mother over her children, bless us. May our compassionate God bless us, now and forever. Amen.